This podcast is brought to you by the Resolve Long Horizon Investing Masterclass, a 10-part evergreen podcast series where Adam Butler, Mike Philbrick, and Rodrigo Gordillo of Resolve Asset Management Global explore an advanced investment framework specifically designed to steward quasi-permanent capital with humility and balance. From the science of decision-making to all-weather portfolio construction to the value of diversified alpha and tail protection, this series provides a comprehensive capital management roadmap to improve outcomes for wealthy individuals, advisors, family offices, and institutions managing less than $10 billion. To listen to the series or read the transcripts on demand, please visit investresolve.com forward slash masterclass. Alternatively, you can find it on your favorite podcast player by searching for resolve dash masterclass. Hello, Hi. hello. All right. Hi. Happy hour on the go. <laughs> yes. Hey, Perth, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Thank you for having me. Um, thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Let's. Uh, <laughs> what's everybody drinking today? Um, I know, uh, Perth, you had a big bottle of vodka right next to you. Yes. Um, yes. That's and then the... a little bit of rosé. You're going to prime <laughs> your vodka drinking with that, with that tiny bit of rosé? Yes. <laughs> There's got to be a name for a drink that combines vodka and rosé. I don't know, but let's name it. This is Cheers. Rodrigo's favorite rosé. It is. So cute. La Ville Ferme is my favorite rosé of all time. It was a <laughs> spot in Toronto called uh, The Local that used to have that as their ah. their special, like half price, you know, basically buy the bottle for the same price you would buy at the LCBO, which is the Canadian version of a communist liquor store. Nice. And so I would um, go freedom. I would, uh, yeah, that's right. It's the opposite, it's right? Like this is a, this is actually perfect. This is actually a perfect segue to the the freedom uh, ETS because yeah. indeed in in Ontario there's one place to buy liquor and it's the liquor board of Ontario, the LCBO. Oh wow! And there were you know you'd have to drive 20 minutes to that go to that one place to have a limited supply, and uh, sure I guess I the advantage is us. The advantage is that they had purchasing power. They, they're one of the biggest um, purchasers of alcohol in the world so that the government could maximize or minimize their cost and then maximize the cost of the end uh, client because the, the taxes are outrageous. Sounds like so it's, for the for the user, it is the most <laughs> expensive in the world, but for the government, it's the cheapest purchase you could have. It's, it's See, that's just... That's, uh... Let's rage about that today. Hey, before that, we, do. we actually need a separate <laughs> disclaimer for Rodrigo's rant there on, on Sorry, the Kevin. LCBO. There's only like a, maybe 20% of those facts are true. So, okay, Rodrigo, give us the full disclaimer. Give no, you go for the, you know what? Because of that, you're doing the disclaimer today. <laughs> okay. Call me out right. on my um, facts. Uh, this is for entertainment purposes only. You should absolutely not take anything that we say as investment advice. And um, we, we hope that everyone has fun and, and joins in and asks questions. And, and uh, thank you very much to Perth for joining us today. So Perth, it's been a while since we've actually caught up a person. I think the last time we got together was for the March for the Fallen. And what, what year would that have been? Like it was 2019, I guess, right? So 19 or 18? 18. Was it? Were you there? Yeah. Was it 19 yeah. or 18? Wow. <laughs> what happened to 2019? There was no... There was no, no, wait, hold on a second. Because it was, you were in the. I was there. Were, were you there when Carmen was there? Like there was, I remember there was a bunker for like four, four so, ladies. So 2018, I did the march. 2019, I was there, but I didn't actually march. So I just showed up for the pizza. Okay, well that's, that's fair. Yeah, okay. well, that's <laughs> that's, that's right. that wasn't that that's wasn't the planned. Wasn't planned to be that way, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, I see. Rod, Rod um, abdicated in 2019. So did I? Well, I think it's wrong about that. I don't even remember. It's all, it's all a blur. He abdicated. Right. All right. All blur. <laughs> <laughs> yes, his his uh, his role at the top of the heap there. He always ran at the very very tip of the the column, uh, if you'll recall. Okay. With all the keeners. Anyway, we, we probably dwelled too long on that. Since that time, Perth, what have you been up to? Tell us tell us your story. I guess before that. Um, and since, yeah. what have you been doing? So uh, 2019, we launched the uh, the fund based on the freedom weighted strategy. And um, so it's been an, it's been a fun ride. Um, I'm 
we just hit a hundred million in AUM. Um, we basically uh, isolated the freedom factor uh, with emerging markets. So because emerging markets, I'll just give a little background in case anyone's not familiar. Emerging markets funds typically have about 40% allocated to autocracies, about 35% currently to China alone. So we saw a lot of concentration risk um, there in the current strategies out there. Um, so we launched the Freedom Weighted, the Freedom 100 um, product um, to, to basically address that issue. And um, so that also investors don't have to allocate so much money to autocracies in their emerging markets allocations. So the Freedom Weighted product, um, we isolated the freedom factor. We look at both personal and economic freedoms, 76 variables, um, quantitative third party uh, metrics. And, uh, and basically that's, that's all we use on the, on the country level. It's hundred percent freedom weighted. It's not an overlay. It's not a uh, tilt. It's hundred percent freedom weighted versus market cap weighted. So, um, so excited to see how people responded to it uh, so far. So let's just, I want to even like, even before we talk about, oh, yeah, we gotta go way that, I'm super, I want to understand oh, okay. <laughs> how, how you even thought about doing, like, tell us a bit about your history where you okay. started, what you were interested in when you got into the industry, and then what led you down this very unique I, path. I see why we need wine for this. Okay. So. Yeah, that's right. We need to, <laughs> this is, uh, this is catharsis at, at its best. Let's yeah. Go. So, um, so I grew up in both China and the US. Uh, I was born in Beijing, grew up there until I was about nine. My parents came to the US. One, uh, my dad came when I was one, my mom came when I was four. I came when I was nine. I was living with my grandparents in the meantime. Um, what year was this? Went, uh, what year did I come over? Yeah, you know it's rude to ask a lady her age. Oh my god, am I? Is that a bad thing? To ask? No, 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 no. 1988. <laughs> okay, I, I am a great actually, at the Canada in '89, actually, so I'm just I, trying to. Yeah, it was three days before my ninth birthday, so I, I say nine because I think of being nine in the U.S. But uh, but yeah, it was I was technically eight, so it's 1988. Um, We're the same age and emigrated at the same time. Really? We eat, we drink the same wine, and those hydrangeas behind that there so are like my favorite of all time. This yeah, is what's I'm just going gonna on. sit back. I'm here sorry. And let you guys mind melt, man. <laughs> okay, wait, go wait. On. Remind me where you came. You am, 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 I came from, from Lima, Peru, from South that's America. That's right. Okay, that, yeah. that's a very free emerging market, by the way. Just yes, not yes, liquid indeed. enough. It's not liquid enough to be in the. In so the free, market. so free that they actually burnt through COVID completely without any vaccinations, and now they're down to nothing. They're very free. What like people just people just did whatever they wanted to, and now it's like COVID is over. Wow, now. I didn't know that. And they're just starting to ramp up vaccinations. Yeah, very true. We'll talk about the freedom of Peru in a second. Um, but go on. Yeah. Sorry, I interrupted. A nine years old came from China, from Beijing. Yeah. And uh, where where in the U.S. did you guys land? I um, grew up in the Dallas area, Plano. If you're familiar with that, um, it's a suburb in Dallas. And uh, yeah. um. After college, I went to college in, in Texas as well at Trinity. And then after college, I um, went back and lived in Hong Kong. I had never shared on a podcast before the, the last one I was on with James Warner in Austin. Um, but the reason I was in Hong Kong was not to like, you know, reconnect with my, uh, you know, background, but it was to reconnect with my dad. I found him. He wasn't around growing up. I found him um, the summer of 2003. And he said, come mm -hmm. to Hong Kong. And so I, I came to Hong Kong <laughs> and that's wow. why I was there. So when I was in Hong Kong, I traveled a lot to like Beijing, Shanghai, other cities, Shenzhen, other cities and in China, um, as you tend to do when you live over there, just travel around. It's only in the U.S. that we tend to like stay in one place a lot. I mean, not not you guys, but a lot of people tend to just stay in there. It's very, you know, insulated. But over there, everybody, you know, travels. So, <clears throat> um, so I traveled a lot throughout China and I, I saw the difference that freedom had made in my life and also in the markets in these places. So, you know, one story that I commonly tell is I had a friend who we called Maggie, who um, didn't have an, an official existence on paper. She didn't have a birth certificate or school records or hospital records or um, social security benefits because she was born the second child and her parents registered her brother for school. This is during the one child policy. So I was born in the yeah. beginning of the one child policy that which lasted for 30 years and then then they went to two and then three so now they're allowed to have three children but that's just an example of the the kind of policies that affect demographics you know affect society affect markets for generations so that's when i realized okay policies matter um made a difference in my life it changed the whole culture of my generation in china um so that was like the seed of it but of course at that time i was 23 i didn't know anything about etfs or anything like that 
So when I came back to the States, I worked at Fidelity as a financial advisor and um, had clients who at the time, you know, all, a lot of clients wanted to invest in China, emerging markets and so forth. Um, but I also had clients who, like me, came from like Saudi Arabia or Russia. I had a Russian client tell me, hey, I don't want to invest in Russia. It's like funding terrorism. Um, so I had clients who had that mentality of where, like, hey, I do believe in the growth in emerging markets, but I believe in the, the, the free people to drive that growth. And I want to invest in the freer ones or just support those markets more. So that's kind of eventually with the growth of ETFs, the growth of passive, um, the idea solidified. And um, I actually left Fidelity not because of this, but because I had a young child and to stay home with her. Uh, but in the back of my mind, this was always there. And so eventually, um, when my kid got old enough to be in school and I had a little more time, um, that I started this. Okay, so what does it look like to, to start this, right? So, I mean, you had this idea of wanting to express your um, views on investing in, in free societies. How did that turn into or, you know, crystallize into an actual mm -hmm. product? Yeah, well, it went very slowly because I was a, a single mom to a young child at the time. But the first thing that needed to happen is we had to have quantifiable metrics or quantified metrics. And at the time, there were not um, human freedom metrics that were quantified. So by human freedom, I mean the combination of personal and economic freedom. And so along with some quant friends of mine, we actually created... Uh, a system of quantifying human freedoms called the HRQ. And we had a human rights quotient and we had um, a provisional patent on this. And then one day when I went to start scoring countries, this is after I left Fidelity, I went to start scoring the countries in preparation to uh, create this index, um, which by the way, scoring the countries using that system takes about four or five months out of the year because you're looking at a lot of countries, a lot of quant, uh, qualified data, not quantified data, and turning it into quantified data. So it's it's a lot of work. Um, and there's a lot of inputs, a lot of data sources. So, um, and there's, you know, of course, 26 countries in the emerging markets universe. So it's, it's, a, it's a lot of work. Um, mm -hmm. So so I went to score the countries or start the process. And when I went to our economic freedom data set source, to their website, which was Fraser um, out of Canada, um, I saw that they had something on their on their website called the Human Freedom Index and data set. I was like, oh, human freedom. So I, I thought they were only good for economic freedom. So I went I went there and I checked it out. Um, remember, we had a patent on a system of doing this at yeah. the time. And I contacted my contact there, Fred, who um, I was like, hey, Fred, what is this? And so we compared notes. And it was almost identical, like the two systems. They use the same like um, uh, ordinal scale system that we used. It was it was almost identical. So I was like, Fred, can I just use this system? And that would save me like four or five, five months out of the year and give me third party objectivity. And he was like, yeah, yeah. that's neat. But, yeah. So that's how we that was the first step is having that um, that data set that um, combined all 76 of those metrics. And, and I'm talking about like civil freedoms or you can call them social freedom, political freedoms and economic freedoms so like civil freedoms are things like terrorism trafficking torture women's rights they have a uh, missing women proxy that um, accounts for things like the one child policy because there's 30 million missing women in china due to that policy um right okay so similar policy to to what you described about your friend yes that's a, the same policy that caused 30 million missing women so she's one of the lucky ones she's not missing she's there but there's 30 million missing women, right? According oh to Chinese okay. official estimates. And some people have it at 60 million, but Chinese official data estimates uh, from Chinese uh, sources are, it's 30 million. Wow. Um, so that's a lot of uh, generations lost, right? So that's very inefficient use of human capital, right? And that's one of the things we try to avoid by, avoid, uh, by investing in freer markets is that very inefficient use of capital. Um, so... So that uh, what, that's basically um, how this started, and uh, we started using this data well, set. Can I? Can I? Can we dig? Okay, so that I got a good idea of the first one. There's three components. Yeah. Go through the yeah. second one and what that means. Yeah. And maybe some examples. Thank you. So, that. so yeah, political freedoms um, are things like 
civil procedures, criminal procedures, uh, judicial independence, freedom of speech, media, expression, religion, internet, so on and so forth. Um, and then economic freedoms are things that we're all familiar with, like taxation, business regulations, freedom to trade internationally, sound money, um, things like that. So all of those combined together, we equal weight every single variable, um, and we use the composite score and then turn those into country weights. You equal weight all of the variables. All uh, 76. So missing women, right? It's one variable. <clears throat> Freedom of okay. speech, one variable. Number of journalists. And like are those truth. variables from zero to 10? What's the. It depends. What's some variables are zero to 10, some are zero to five, some are zero to 100. It just depends on the variable, but they're all, we normalize it all and it it's. Okay. The in score is zero to 10. So then we turn it to zero to 100 for the sake of our, for it to work in our algorithm. And then, so you're, we're, we're talking about countries. Do we also get into regions? Like for example, I, India has got, you know, a single state will have the population in the United States, similar in China, like are there, I guess China is more uniform, mm. but are there, no, is it's it country not, based actually, or is it state based? It's country, country based, country level okay. only. Um, and that's a good point because yeah, in, in a lot of these countries, there are variations regionally. Um, yeah. But yeah, we are looking at the, the country base. And, and the reason we look at country versus security level metrics, is because most ESG is security level metrics, actually all ESG except us. And we don't claim to be ESG, um, is security level. Oh. Um, we don't look at security level because the countries, the, the governments in these countries are best positioned to protect human freedoms, not companies. Right. Yeah. How do you address the potential issue of, and I'm sure you get this all the time, but I mean, you could anticipate a situation where um, a slew of countries with very small market caps end up with very high scores. Mm. And like, yeah. So, so yeah, we do so have. You, you've got liquidity yeah. issues there, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we have a, a it's so if you look at the process, right, the first step is actually not freedom waiting. The first step is we exclude countries that have too low market caps and too low um, liquidity. So the minimum market cap and minimum liquidity comes first. And that brings the 26 country universe down to about 18. So countries like Peru are very free, but don't have the liquidity, the minimum liquidity um, that we need. Oh, man, we're not uh, in your, countries. we're not in your index. No, it's so sad. Almost though, like you're almost there. Uh, it's Come the liquidity issue. Oh, this it's commodity liquidity. boom cycle is going to be so good for us. We're going to be in there in no time. <laughs> I've actually been to Peru and I love it. Uh, yeah, I, I want that uh, country. Just make an that. exception. Just break the rule once. <laughs> oh, yeah. You guys know how, how, how that goes <laughs> in a rules-based strategy. So, I uh, thought friends backed like... up friends. What's going on? All right. <laughs> Go on. Sorry. Yeah. Liquidity and then countries up. like Czech Republic are too small, right? Um, but they're very free. So, so we actually exclude those. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> the, does, so is there a threshold by which the freedom quotient is so low that you exclude them all together or are you weighting no. all countries and keeping them in at whatever freedom weight they should deserve? This is a great question. We look at the relative freedom to years. The relative absolute freedom level. So that sounds weird, right? Relative absolute. So we don't look at the change in freedom or the anticipated change in freedom. So like Argentina, when they, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, we expected a lot of good changes on the economic freedom front, but it didn't actually happen, but they were expected. So if we had looked at, you know, the trajectory, we might have included a country like Argentina, which we did not because we look at the absolute freedom level. Um, the, you, if you look at the traje you know, expected trajectories, then you're going to include like Venezuela, the worst freedom countries because they have nowhere to go but up, right? Um, so we don't do that. And also we don't look at like a line in the sand, like what you're talking about, where you have to be, let's say like, you know, there's 100, 162 countries, you have to be number 81 or above. No, we don't do that um, because it's all relative to their peers. A lot of emerging markets are autocracies and they're coming out of autocracies. Um, there was a time when Thailand was in the index and they're a military world you know, country. So um, they're not in there currently, but, you know, as the um, freedom weighting, the freedom scores change, 
uh, a country's decline in their score could push another country who didn't change in their score into the index. So it's all relative to their emerging market peers. So you, you said earlier that you don't claim to be ESG. I mean, this seems to me to be squarely in the domain of environmental, social, and governance, right? This is sort of governance at the highest level. Yeah. So why have you shied away from claiming to be ESG? So the reason why I try to distance ourselves from ESG is, first of all, we don't look at the country level ESG metrics that Sustainalytics uses or whatever. Um, second of all, emerging markets ESG is kind of a joke. Like if you look at iShares product, emerging markets ESG, it's got 40% in China, like the parent index. It can only deviate 1% from the parent index. It's basically like greenwashing, you know? So it's, it's a bit of a joke in emerging markets. And I have come out with a piece and I can send it to you guys. You can link it here if you like, uh, in one of our investor yeah, absolutely. updates that, you know, that talks about this, where you have to have a, a basis of freedom before you can talk about company level ESG. Because if you don't even have freedom of speech or freedom of media, then there is no independent verification for the data that a company or a government puts out. So that data becomes less meaningful as a, a way to measure the impact of your investments. And uh, so you so, have to so have- So that index value. is whatever market cap weight plus an ESG tilt, that's as far as they've gone on? They're, yeah, Just well, the what tilting they do is, is enough they, to call you know, it ESG. They exclude alcohol, tobacco. This is the iShares product. Excludes alcohol, right. tobacco, weapons, uh, whatever other ESG stuff uh, is excluded, um, with the caveat that it cannot deviate more than 100 basis points from the parent index, so the parent non ESG market cap weighted index. So oh it is God. market okay. cap weighted, yeah. <laughs> so I, I just, so, so I guess maybe I'm not understanding how indices and products come to be labeled as ESG. Is there, is there a hard like neon bright lines around the definition now? Cause it seemed to me like it's, yeah. it was always very fuzzy and you could create whatever narrative you like. I mean, from yeah. your comments, it seems to me that your approach is far more true to the idea of ESG than the expression of ESG in some of the more popular products, right? So yeah. why not sort of try to elevate the definition of ESG um, with you know your freedom index and your freedom concept rather than shying away from the category as a whole? Because it just seems like you're you're sort of sidestepping what is a uh, a huge fire hose of capital flowing in in the, in a, the direction of ESG, I think your assertion is at least when it comes to emerging markets, many of the products are misguided in their construction. Why not sort of elevate the conversation? And say this is what you should think about when you think about ESG in an emerging market context, rather than saying we're not ESG because yeah. the other ESG products don't really express the values that we're trying to um, express. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. Like, I, I would love to hear from the audience, you know, if we started calling ourselves ESG, let's say that, and by the way, there's a lot of scrutiny on that now from the SEC, but yeah. let's say we use, we add ESG factors, okay? Let's say we exclude the two companies we have that are bottling companies, which would be excluded based on alcohol, right? Um, then if we called it ESG, would investors think that's a more true kind of representation of our product. So I would love to hear if what people think about that, because that's a really well, help good me, point. Help me out because I, I'm still, I, I'm really, I'm now curious because I don't. Yeah. So if, do you need to exclude companies that are considered to be non ESG in order to be like, I just how clear is the definition? Yeah, I actually you don't know. The SEC, um, I yeah. think, so I think the, the SEC way that the, most emerge, most ESG, not just emerging markets, will use some kind of industry standard exclusion or whatever metric to exclude like alcohol, tobacco, gambling, uh, you know, porn and stuff like that. So, um, so, so yeah, most would have to do some kind of company level metrics, I think. So if we wanted to call ourselves ESG first, we'd have to add those company level metrics, uh, which we've experimented before because there's actually a, uh, a firm that licenses our index for ESG SMAs. And they add their own ESG on top of it. And what happens when they do that is they exclude like two or three countries every year. <laughs> so it's like really? very little change. Well, but the then thing they is, ESG. 
So, yeah. It's, it's been interesting for me. And again, this is, I guess, something we all need to educate more ourselves more on is that ESG tends to be whatever the ESG buyer claim, uh, de deems to yeah. be important to them, right? As it's very this personal. particular SMA provider has done. So the idea that you couldn't present your case to be, as Adam alluded to, you know, the, the gold standard of ESG on the G side and that be enough seems like you know seems that's something you can definitely do and claim and actually be one of the least uh greenwash things on the on the investment <laughs> team right now i agree and yeah, without maybe. without eliminating companies that don't meet traditional esg standards like i think you could sort of say no we don't believe esg the, an expression of esg needs to eliminate certain companies for the reasons that you yeah. just described which i thought were really reasonable um, no, but also the other thing way. is like, there's so much of this anti ESG buzz going around and maybe that's just because I'm on FinTwit or something, but, um, you know, and ESG is a lot of buzz, but not a lot of asset flow. No, I, I see mean, what you're doing. Bro. You know what I mean? It's a takeaway so close. It's like, don't, I don't want to be, no, I, I don't even yeah. want to be labeled ESG <laughs> hint, hint, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. You know, yeah. that's a great, yeah. like, yeah. I don't well, even, no, like, I'm so ESG. Too. I don't want to be part of this group. <laughs> it's great. I love it. <laughs> okay. That's a good point because like, yeah, that some people are like, okay, you're actually ESG. So we don't care what you call it. We're going to put you as ESG. But I think there's a lot of our clients that at least m most of the ones that I know don't use us as part of an ESG portfolio. They use us as part of their core emerging markets, which is the bigger asset um, pool. So well, listen, for what it's worth, I think you're, you definitely should take a position in that space. It's a growing space. Um, the, the, the reason for wanting to be SG, this generation pushing for a better world is a good thing. It's something that's noble and we should try and, and do better for society in the next generation. And of course, what's yeah. happening is that everybody's finding a way to call themselves CSG for the pure purpose of profit rather than um actually doing good i think you can position yourself without feeling bad about it as some is a fund that's actually trying to do good and not feel any shame for being part of that growth in that space i think you would do you would actually add to it so 100 percent. I, I endorse that. the esg <laughs> label you you got the okay. official gordillo stamp <laughs> sweet thank you the official yeah, so, yeah. Uh, peruvian uh that's right yeah. emerging market stamp that's what it looks like yeah <laughs> Well, we want to do the maximum amount of good, right? Yeah. I mean, and, and if you want to do the maximum amount of good in this industry, sadly, oftentimes you need to conform to whatever the industry nomenclature is, right? And you've got to fit into a category. And yeah. I mean, it seems to me that if, um, and it's it's a tremendous success to get um, any fund to $100 million. So so I'm absolutely, I'm celebrating that huge success. Thank you. Um, and, I, and I think yes. you would get to multiple <laughs> billions if you would if you would position yourself um, squarely in the ESG column, <laughs> because I think you'd be able to redefine what ESG means in an emerging market context. And, um, you know, I would just love to see you elevate the conversation there and, and take a leadership role. So right. maybe we should, maybe we that should discuss that. You guys, you guys should like do my marketing for me from now on. <laughs> okay, you're in. That's, that's fine. You know okay. us in the FinTwit community. We all help each other in one way or another. <laughs> you know, right. but let's let's I'd like to discuss perceptions here, because I think if we're going to be fair with regard to the ESG conversation and the idea that E, S and G are in the eye of the beholder, I would say that possibly people in uh, in power in China, in Venezuela, in Iran and the like might take offense to you taking offense to their um, to their lack of freedom. Oh, yes. We see lack of freedom a certain way, as in you get to do whatever you want. You got the freedom to do anything. But then you're taken away from society by not keeping them disciplined and focusing on what's most important. The thing that comes to mind for me is China taking uh, making it illegal for kids to be gaming as often as they are. A lot of people in the mm -hmm. West were like, you know, I don't love everything that China does, but that's pretty good. That's <laughs> probably a good thing for society long term. That is a, that is up there for me in terms of like the freedom of the mind to explore and do something great. So how do you feel about pushback there and, and, and your definition of what freedom is versus 
a I mean, no you're gonna get pushback regardless of what you do so um what i found though with um and actually recently got some really weird pushback from uh, actually people in Hong Kong, a random comment I made on Twitter. Um, and I love Hong Kong so much. I mean, it's part of the inspiration for me doing this. So uh, these are just people who don't know me, so I don't care, but um, that wasn't even market related comment. So, uh, but uh, I think two things I, I learned from the pushback. One is with this most recent case, there's been a lot of trauma uh, in these countries, especially with Hong Kong. and. People are, are are worn thin, and so anything you say that's you know could be perceived the wrong way, um, and that's just the, the way with social media. Uh, but the other thing is that I learned throughout the time of doing this fund is okay, we do get some pushback. Um, we also get a lot of encouragement, um, and what I've noticed is that the the pushback from depending on the country, it's it, country per country is very uh, different uh, by country. So for example, I was in. New York, um, in a subway at one point, we were all waiting for this train that just wouldn't come. Um, and talking to these other people next to me and they were human rights lawyers from Brazil. And at this time, Brazil wasn't in the index. They are barely now. Uh, but they were like, hey, so is Brazil in your index? And I was like, no. And they were like, ah, that's about right. So they like totally agreed with me. Um, and then, you know, but, but China, which has never been in our index, when this launched, I got so much hate from um, China, uh, you know, internet and, uh, you know, and I can understand that. And they're the only people that I can speak out in China are pro government, pro, um, CCP. So, so they have, you don't have the dissenting voices and, um, almost have to take that side. So, um, so yeah, no, what I don't were their arguments? Hate. What were, what were their, um, arguments for them <laughs> being free? Um, there were no really great ones, but the best one that I heard, um, and this was actually a huge favor they did for us. Um, the best one that I heard was somebody actually uh, was like, hey, why do you, you know, this is stupid, but, you know, uh, Naspers, which is a South African company that invested a lot in Tencent back in the day, and they made a lot of money on that investment, right? So they're like a media uh, private investment company. So they, they invested a lot in Tencent, and uh, Tencent became their entire market cap. And it became so big that it was too big for the, it was taking over the Johannesburg Exchange. And so they had to like spin off a piece of it to this company called Process and list in Amsterdam. And so, um, so, so they were like, this is a fraud because you have a company that is all Tencent. And I was like, <laughs> that is a good point. That's and so, a good point. so that's when you got to get the fundamental hat on, right? Yeah. So we actually made a rule at the next rebalance. Because we have, to, we can't just, I can't just exclude NASPERS, right? It's a South African domiciled company. They don't answer to the Chinese government. Uh, the Chinese government can't come in and say, oh, you're, you're a nonprofit now overnight, like they can with Chinese companies, right? So I couldn't just exclude that one company without a systematic rule. Um, so we made one. And it was, if a company has over 80% of its assets in the stock of another company of an excluded country, then it's excluded. So... We applied that rule across the board to the entire, you know, list of holdings and only NASPERS met that rule and got kicked out. So that was a huge favor. I want to thank those people on Twitter who pointed this out and also then picked up by some journalists who brought it to my attention. So I actually really appreciate the dissenting voices um, sometimes. And they have some says, you. Who says that Twitter is action. not, yeah, Twitter is not, is, is evil. No, I didn't, so I actually just, didn't take that very as, well. No, I didn't. I didn't oh. take it very well at first, and, <laughs> and I was like, wait. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> so, so they were right, and I just, you know, of course, I wasn't happy about it at the time, um, but then I was very happy about it afterwards because that was a. It did That's us a great. huge favor. So, yeah. So, so I'm a little confused. So maybe you can help clarify. The way I understood it is you. The index is constructed by first kind of. Um, instituting a liquidity threshold. And if you're above the mm -hmm. liquidity threshold, then you go into the ranking mechanism, right? Yeah. So country, country level. At the country level. Yeah. yeah. So obviously China would exceed the liquidity threshold. Yeah. Right. So yes. wouldn't it go into your ranking mechanism and it would just rank very low in many categories and therefore have a very small weight, but not a zero weight? No, our algorithm actually assigns negative weights. 
to countries oh. that yeah so it assigns negative weights to the worst countries and then it's an iterative strategy so we do iterations until there are no countries that are assigned negative weights it's not it's not we don't short it's just right you know, we don't take a yeah, long i don't think position. you could short i don't think it would be a good shorting strategy yeah. <laughs> necessarily it's long only <laughs> But this is algorithm. a values-based ETF, right? Yeah. Not rather than an alpha-based ETF, yeah. <laughs> okay, so you're ranking all of the countries on these 76 um, variables. Yeah. And then it's it, it's not an ordinal ranking or it's a rescaled ordinal yeah, ranking? No, no, no. So that the, if it's- So oh, you're looking, talking about two things. One is the freedom scoring. One is the freedom weighting, okay? The freedom hmm. scoring does use ordinal scales sometimes to turn- okay to turn quanti qualitative data into qual quantitative data. So that's mm -hmm. organal sales. And by that, I mean, okay, if there's 20 journalist killings in one country in a particular year, we give it a score of zero. If it's 15, we give it a score of one. If it's 10, we give it a score of two and so forth. That's mm -hmm. one of the scoring mechanisms. Once okay. we have the overall score, then we throw that score into our freedom weighting algorithm. And that's a totally different algorithm. And that algorithm is the iterative strategy that applies weights to the countries. And that's how we get the country allocations. Would you indulge a nerdy quant by sort of walking me through the, the weighting methodology? Or is it really complicated and would bore everybody to death? No, it's, it's basically, that's basically all it is. It's very simple. <laughs> what you just said. <laughs> no, but I don't, so I still don't understand. So you've got... So you've got all these ordinal scores, or are they are they just ranked? So like no, you've no, got no. all the different okay, scores. Okay, so there's 76 scores. Some of them came yeah. from ordinal scales. Okay. So don't worry about the ordinal scales. They all come out with a, a metric, a, a quantitative yeah. score per country. So let's okay. say Taiwan scores 8.7 out of 10. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we use that 8.7, and that 8.7 is the combination of the 76. Right. So we use that 8.7, put it into our, our freedom weighting algorithm along with the other countries in the eligible universe. And that algorithm then turns them into weights. And they're all at that point, they're all zero to 10, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah all the scores are between zero and 10. And they're typically and like, it's a not, let's say this is zero to 10, they're typically like this. Yeah. Like between right. four and eight, <laughs> yeah. Before four and eight, and, and you weight them accordingly yeah. based on their, on yeah. on their final score, that normalized yes. score there. So, okay, just out of curiosity, which country is the most free? Um, out of the emerging markets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Taiwan. Cool. Out of all well, markets, I, it's like New Zealand. That's that's so that's awesome. That's like. So controversial. It's not even funny in so many levels. Right? <laughs> and like with COVID and all the things happening in New Zealand and Australia, everybody's like, oh my gosh, like, how are you, how is this going to affect the, the scores? And first of all, mm -hmm. I don't do the scores. Fraser, Cato, Friedrich Nelman, Freedom House, those guys do the scores. Okay. Um, yeah. So ask them that, but also they already have things that account for this, like freedom of assembly, freedom of movement, freedom of, uh, uh, you know, speech. I don't know if like vaccine choices, yes, freedom of speech. Yeah. And so, um, so the, there are things that are, will, will be affected by what's so, going on. So I actually, yeah. I actually missed it. What was the lowest scoring country again? It's Venezuela. Okay. So Venezuela is in. Venezuela and Syria are typically no, they're not like, in. they're not, they, they don't have a, they're not in That's the a, no, they're, sorry, the they're lowest scoring though. country in the data set or in, in, our index? The, in the in the in the index. Okay. So in the index, even the lowest scoring country is relatively freer than its peers. All right. Yeah. So right now it's Malaysia. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it's a still a relatively freer country than like China, Russia, Saudi Arabia, right. those types of countries. It's but it's but it's the lowest in our index because we have the freest country set. Gotcha. Right. I yeah. would love for you to tell me because I, I know um or at least if I recall, Rob Arnott was one of the first people that you met with about this concept, right? Um, yeah. So I'd love for you to like, how did that come about? And <laughs> what, did you, what did you guys talk about? I love telling this story. Thanks for asking about it. So um, so basically, when I first started this, I had no idea what was going on. I just want to try to get an idea of the you know ETF ecosystem, try to figure out what's going on. 
So I went to Inside ETFs, right? Like the most, the biggest ETF conference in the world. Um, and that year, I believe it was 2016. What is happening with Rodrigo? He's got a I'm standing just, uh, desk. I'm going to my spaceship. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. You so, lift off. <laughs> so this was like way before we even had anything. Um, but I went to this Inside ETF 2016 and um, shout out to Inside ETFs for uh, letting me go that year for, uh, you know, less than the, <laughs> the rate I was supposed to pay. Um, and, uh, and so, so I, uh, they were like, yeah, we think you can learn a lot. So come on over. <laughs> um, so, so I went there and that year there was an intra-conference app um, where you can kind of tweet people within the conference. And mm -hmm. somebody who was in a China talk tweeted out, I can't believe this guy is talking about China. And not once has he mentioned the one child policy and its implications. And I'm like, Hey, somebody here knows and cares about the one child policy. And <laughs> so I, you know, talked to him, ended up meeting him. And um, he's like, hey, I'm the president of a couple of really small CFA societies in Tennessee. Um, would you come and speak? And so I go and speak at these like tiny CFA societies, literally like 20 people. I think it, it was Chattanooga. Uh, and the guy's name is... Uh, um, he just literally texted me while we're on here. Ralph Lehman. So Ralph invites me to go speak there. And um, and they ended up liking the talk. I was talking about like basically, you know, new metrics for emerging markets, China being the inspiration. Um, and then they recommended me for uh, a Tampa Society. So, you know, all the societies like recommended speakers. Um, and Tampa was a forecast panel dinner. So it was bigger and it was like 300 people. I was on the panel. Remember, it's my first year doing this. I had no idea what was going on. Wow. I was on the panel yeah, that's huge. with... Yeah, I was on the panel with David Kotak, BlackRock, and Morningstar. I was like, <laughs> so, <laughs> wow, that's so amazing. we get through that, and then David Nerve Kotak, it, it goes well, and David Kotak, um, afterwards, uh, he and Sharon were there, and Sharon uh, Prasant, who runs the, the Camp Kotak, invites me to Camp Kotak, and I'm like, who does this? It's like 50 wow. economists that go that's fishing. That's amazing. Yeah, like apparently it's like, like, you know, I didn't know that it was also like super exclusive thing. And uh, it's like, 50, I'm like, <laughs> there's 50 economists that go fishing in the middle of the woods by Canada with no Wi-Fi. Like who does this? And so I was working with Christian Magoon at Amplify at the time. And Christian's like, dude, you should go, you know, um, you can meet Barry Ritholtz because Barry goes to this thing, you know, master's in business guy. I was like, oh, yeah. So, so I was like, OK, I'll, I'll go and, you know, meet Barry Ritholtz and all these other people. Um, so I was supposed to take a, a car from the Bangor airport to the campsite, which would be a two and a half hour drive in the woods like this, um, because I didn't want to take a seaplane. But then I was so tired when I headed in, because I, I was heading in from Boston, New York and meetings there. And I called from the LaGuardia airport. I was like, hey, I called the seaplane company. I was like, can I, is it too late to get a seaplane? I'm coming in today. And they were like, no, it's fine. You can share with Rob or not. He doesn't have anyone to share the seaplane with, and it's two, two people per plane. So if I didn't go, he would have to pay the full price for two people. I was like, okay. So they're like, they, um, <laughs> they give me his American Airlines flight number and I intercept him at the airport. I'm like, hey, <laughs> did they tell you we were gonna be riding together? He was like, yeah. So, <laughs> so we ended up riding together. And by the way, Rob doesn't go to this thing every year. He went like previously seven years prior. And then to this day, he hasn't gone back. Um, so okay. I was there. He was only there that year because he lost a bet to Barry Redholtz and he was there to pay his bet. And a moment <laughs> so in you, time. Thank you, Barry. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and so and then, by the way, when I left Fidelity and I wanted to start this, I called research affiliates because I was such a fan because, you know, they do non cap weighted indexing. I wanted to do non cap weighted indexing. And I was like, hey, do you guys want to work together? And they were like, no, please go away. And so, <laughs> <laughs> so I actually tried. You don't understand. I was in a plane with Rob Arnott. I thought <laughs> no, that, that was before. all. I, that, that was that before tuition? that happened. That was before oh, Rob Arnott's okay. plane. So then, like a year after that, I was, or maybe two years, two years after that, I was in a plane with Rob Arnott. And, you know, he heard the idea. We fished together for four days, you know, three days with these uh, 50 economists and finance people like Barry. <laughs> and, um, and then he became our first seed investor. He was like, or basically, oh, I asked him to be on a call with me. I was like, since you like the idea and I could use the, the, you know, the credibility boost, why don't you get on a call with me? I'm trying to convince these people to invest. 
And he's like, sure. So he gets on the call. People didn't end up investing. After the call, he writes me and he's like, hey, I'll put in a million. So that was like wow. before we had a fund, the fund didn't exist. And the, the index didn't exist in its current form. And he decided to invest. And so that was huge. Um, that's huge. And, yeah, that's really cool. And that and, and then that investment grew over time. Now he owns basically 9.9% .9 of life and liberty indexes. Um, so he's at an LP now um, in my firm. And I could not have orchestrated that. Like that, I tried with research affiliates. They were not interested. Um, so that's not something I could have orchestrated. And that's just one of, you know, that's one of my favorite stories to tell, but also that's just one of many um, where I had these confirmations along the way that this is a product that, that was, this is something that was bigger than me. I couldn't make it happen on my own. Um, and yeah. it needed to exist. So, <laughs> yeah, so it needed to exist. I find, you know, almost everybody in this industry is in it to find the right wave and, you know, whatever that is, you're going to put your whole effort into and try to grow it from a perspective of growing your own private wealth. There's more to it than that for you, I see in this uh, ETF, given your background. Um, and it's it's like I said earlier, it seems like it's a value based investment, right? There's a group of individuals who care deeply about this. It's yeah. a mission. It, it's a mission, right? It you, is. You found your tribe. And, and so is there like a community of people that like, have you created your own subreddit and like, you know, what's the uh, the bogglehead uh, crowd that talks about this stuff? Like, how are you finding the community in this space? Oh, she's she is. Did we lose her? I think we lost her. She's been a little bit jittery throughout. Yeah. Well, we'll get her back. I really and feel like was, it's a missed opportunity. How is Thailand? Because to... you lived in Thailand a couple of years ago. Uh, a well, couple 20 years, years ago. A couple of years ago. Yeah. I'm always curious about Thailand as, as a society. And how did it, how did you, uh, how, was, how was Thailand at the time? And how do you think it is now from a freedom perspective? Yeah. I mean, it seemed like an extremely free society when I was there. Um, but then I wasn't really paying much attention to the political context and um i mean yeah. yeah i was there sort of teaching and enjoying the beaches and traveling southeast asia so it wasn't a top priority for me to to evaluate the the uh you know social and political the, the freedom, and economic freedom of the yeah, thailand that's at the right time. sorry but exactly. lost you there and we're talking about the yeah, you were going to tell about us about how you build your community <laughs> yeah oh no i mean i th i think the community uh so when i left fidelity it was really hard because, you know, you have your coworkers when you're working for a big company and, you know, you can bounce ideas off. You're talking to each other like there's office banter, right? I didn't realize how social media would become office banter. Like, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like on Twitter, it's like, it's like your office, basically. And um, that's one of the things that surprised me most is how much uh, that kind of built our culture and our community. Um, so really thankful for so that. Probably everyone listening what to us now is yeah. From I that. mean, yeah. you certainly find your tribe in Twitter. I think we we definitely found that ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, what's what I'm interested in with regard to your concept of what freedom is, and I guess it's not yours anymore, but it's a Fraser Institute that's doing creating this quotient. Mm -hmm. um, you Cato, you were excluding Fraser, certain others. you're excluding certain nations. I think one of them was freedom of religion, right? And uh, mm -hmm. I imagine there are categories there that a liberal group might find not welcome, right? That they might feel like if freedom of religion is this, that's conflicting, let's say, with women's rights. Something's over. Having the ability to be free mm -hmm. about your religion or the women's rights that that religion infringes on. Interesting. So, so like you in know, Saudi Arabia, for example, they're saying, okay, yeah. it's my religion to not let women drive or whatever. Right. Um, so that would, in that particular instance, that would be captured in both uh, women's freedoms. So there's women's freedom to of movement. There's women's um, rights to children after divorce. There's FGM. There's um, women's uh, missing women, right? And there's women's rights yeah. to an inheritance. Those are the five women's freedom proxies. So all of those would be deemed in a country like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, 
UAE, um, which are all emerging market countries. Um, so, so those would all be dinged there, but freedom of religion would also be dinged there because just because you have one religion doesn't mean they're allowing other religions. So they're not gonna allow Christianity, uh, you know, uh, Jewish religions, like, you know, those types of, or like Hindu or, you know, Buddhist, it's only, only Muslim. Whereas in China, it's like no religions are allowed, especially not Muslim right now. And it's just, you know, there's, there's, you know, absolutely no religious freedom whatsoever. So, so right. th I think China and Saudi Arabia uh, type of countries would be similar in that respect because of the, and actually China would probably rank a little better on women's freedoms. So, right. um, yeah, maybe much better on women's freedoms. But yeah, so it, if you it move, would be captured move, in the overall. In the overall. If you move outside of that, a bit of what becomes an echo chamber in, in, in Twitter, because it's your tribe. When you're mm. talking to people that have never heard of you and you tell them about your idea, do you get the vast majority of people being really excited about it? Or do some people find it a little off-putting that you're creating this type of what could be seen as exclusion uh, index? Yeah. I mean, it's just a waiting mechanism. <laughs> so um, we, yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's people who um, would would find it, you know, off-putting. But do you get um, anybody being like that? Is it generally, you know, people, do, do people perceive it as a general thing? Like, I'm just curious whether you get any pushback. Yeah, I think uh, like it's overwhelming. The percentage of pushback you get from the average person that hears it for the first time. I think the average person doesn't care how you weight emerging markets countries, uh, but the average person in finance, um, I, <laughs> they're like, what? Like I, I literally the other day, I was like, right? Like the other day I was like, what a breath of fresh air, Perth. You're, you're, yeah, you're so like, right. You know, I have like this, you know, multiple mom groups that I'm in that the text groups. Right. And I, as the other day I was like, oh my gosh, like literally not one of these guys who I consider my friends know what I do at all. And so I was like, you know, it's okay. My wife theory. doesn't know what I do. So it's, yeah. you know, it's like <laughs> I don't think you're alone. Thing. Yeah. So I'm really thankful yeah. for you guys. Um, yeah. but also, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, but, but also, you know, the, uh, I think, you know, with something like this, we're, we're going to probably, yeah, yeah. You know, offend some people and even sometimes the, the wrong side will offend, you know, because, you know, we don't have certain countries, but, uh, and, and yeah, so like blackouts and in the internet and in places that had uh, protests, they had, you know, media freedom issues, um, coercing of journalists by the government, uh, and they had the repression of the cash bowl. So their score dropped slightly, like not slightly, but their score dropped um, last year and it kicked them out of the index, it kicked Brazil into it. Um, so all of our fans in India, and we had a lot of fans in India and I love India, uh, no, nobody said anything and they, you know, and they're still supporting us and they're like, well, we hope it gets back in and I do, but, uh, you know, it's like, um, it's so close. It's and not your like personal vendetta, right? Like yeah. you're not expressing your personal views here. You've right. got it's a not like my extremely subject of opinion, is that... my subject yes, of okay. opinion doesn't go into it at all. Like there's yeah. but, no room but for I my opinions. I want to, I want to continue to pull on this thread one more time and then we can I actually want to learn a little bit more about opening up an ETF and and working with okay. Alpha that stuff. <laughs> You're uh, really good at pulling on the thread. <laughs> am I, like am I, I keep, I keep on not getting the answer I want. <laughs> Honestly um, not. <laughs> I actually okay so you do it's not like you do have a personal um interest in a freedom index clearly. Yeah. So it's not sure. like but once you have it there's there's an algorithm and you can say look whatever happens in the yeah. future it's preset. Don't blame me for India being out. That's cool. But your views of wanting to put life's um, time into this thing, I would imagine a lot of people that talk about negatively about China, for example, are afraid of traveling to China. Mm -hmm. um, do you find any pressure there? Do you do you find yourself questioning whether you're going to go visit Hong Kong? or are going to travel toward the, to Beijing because of your oh. message? No, I, I've fully accepted that I cannot travel to Hong Kong or China anymore. I absolutely can't. Um, so that's yeah, actually that's kind of incredible. sad because I, I love Hong yeah. Kong. Yeah. But the Hong Kong today is not the same uh, as I was there. No. Um, but still, I love it. And, you know, I, I wish I could still go back without fear of... <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, being turned back yeah, would, would be the best case scenario. Uh, but, but yeah, no, I, I don't. And I think a lot of I think a lot of people in this work, like our data providers, used to go to Hong Kong and present at the Lion Rock Institute and uh, all the time. And now they don't. I think it's it's just accepted around the world now that Hong Kong is different and uh, China has become more authoritarian and, and you got to be more careful if you're doing any kind of freedom related or human rights related work. Personal okay, well, look, before we get into getting, yeah. before yeah. we get into Rodrigo's mechanics of ETF creation, <laughs> I want to <laughs> I, I want to for you. I want to talk about I want to <laughs> talk about um, what a lot of people I think are going to be interested in um, that watch this broadcast, which is what what is the sort of expected investment performance? Like if you go back through time and sort of see how this selection mechanism has. Um, manifested in terms of choosing uh, countries that have gone out on to outperform while they're highly ranked in the index. Do you, can you give any guidance or sense of what that has looked like uh, over time, either sort of yeah. hypothetically or, and, or in live um, trading? Yeah, well, we launched the the ETF in 2019 in May have a lot of really good history, all of COVID drawdown and all of COVID recovery <laughs> uh, so far. And um, it's, it's you know, our premises was, okay, freer markets, they have more sustainable growth. It's less like government mandated debt driven growth, like Evergrande, right? Um, it's It recovers faster from drawdowns. That was a premise we had. And then it uses capital more efficiently. Um, so we got a chance to test that in 2020. Um, we did underperform the drawdown and that's because we had no China. China outperformed everyone globally in the in the drawdown, COVID drawdown. Um, and then we outperformed the recovery. So we outperformed emerging markets, broad emerging markets, emerging markets ESG, and emerging markets X China. So we outperformed everyone in the recovery. So that I'm glad it turned out that way because that was the premise that you know we would outperform in a recovery environment. And so at the if you zoom out on that on that period of underperformance and that period of outperformance, it ends out it turns out about the same. So it was like same as the benchmark um, in 2020. And in fact, if you zoom out over the two and a half years, the fund has been live. It is very like almost identical. So it, it's the same, it's a little higher, but almost identical. So it's the same. And that's due to, you know, periods of both underperformance and outperformance. Of course, this year we're outperforming because of China underperforming. So, uh, so, so that's, uh, uh, it should, I think, um, be a pretty good reflection of emerging markets as a whole um, and kind of almost reflect that benchmark, even though we don't we have a much freer country set. And that's what really what we're going for. We're not going for, we're not promising alpha. Although obviously in the long term, I believe that freer countries will have alpha, especially if we if Wall Street continues to misprice autocracy risk, like the ones in China. Um, and I, I believe Wall Street will continue to misprice that. Um, because of the feedback loops that go on, people trying to get licenses there, so they have to say good things because you know government grants those licenses. So um, that's going to continue, and as long as that continues, there will be alpha to be had in the freer emerging markets, and I believe that. But that's not what we're promising. We're just promising a diverse, you know, broad, you know, ten country emerging markets country set that is much freer than your benchmarks out there. And do you have any interest for a freedom bond ETF? I do have interest in that. <laughs> we have interest in, in that, Frontier, a lot of other ideas, ESG version, um, a security level. Um, so there's a lot of different ideas that we have in mind. Um, to be honest, right now, I'm like, I don't know what we should do next. Um, there's so many options. There's so many uh, great people that are willing to help us. Um, and I'm very thankful for that. Uh, but honestly, like I... I'm like, I don't know what we should do <laughs> next uh, as our next product. There's, or even there's something to be said be. about focusing on this one yeah. thing and, and getting so, it to a couple billion, right? Yeah, I'm really enjoying focusing on this one thing right now. So so I don't know. I don't know when or if or what the next product will be at this, at this time. <laughs> All right. Well, now we can maybe talk about your partnership with Alpha Architect and how did that okay. come about and... Um, how, what is your, you know, current working arrangement with those guys? How have they helped you out, and how did have you, helped you them know out what and... you were getting into? Yeah, when you decided <laughs> to get into it. That's a, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah, so that's a great question. Um, you guys know Wes really well, 
So um, definitely you can, you can uh, understand that. Um, those guys are great. So they obviously they're freedom fighters. Uh, so obvious choice of partner, but mm -hmm. before I you know, thought about working with them, I was trying to license this out to like iShares and, you know, SSGA. And I met with all those firms and, you know, uh, and of course they weren't interested. Uh, there were a couple of mid-sized firms that were interested. Um, and we had talks and didn't work out each time. And then eventually I was like, well, great. Well, we have to, I guess we have to launch this on our own. <laughs> so that's when I talked to Rob and Rob was like, okay, I'll invest such and such amount. I want to own this much amount of the firm, whatever. Um, I was like, okay. So, so then I talked to, to Wes, actually I talked to Rob afterwards, but first I talked to Wes, I went to their democratized quant conference. Um, and I had known Wes for a couple of years at this point. And I was like, Hey, do you, you know, do you guys partner with us and launch this together? And at this time they didn't have their ETF architect white label platform. And mm -hmm. they thought about doing that uh, apparently. So, and they were like, no, he was like, no, dude, that's exactly, you know, you know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, totally <laughs> so that sounds right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so he was like, you should do this on your own. And so then through the rest of that year, this was democratized quant, so like March ish, throughout the rest of the year until like Thanksgiving time, he's teaching me to do it on my own, you know, like he does, because that's what he does. He just mentors people. Um, amazing. And so, so I was ready to do it on my own at that point. And, you know, at the time, he still needed an exempted relief. Mine was being drafted by US Bank. And he had helped me negotiate deals with U.S. Bank, things like that. Like, he's been great all this time. And then around Thanksgiving, we're on, on the phone. He's like, great idea. He's like, you should do this with us. And I'm like, did we not already have this conversation? <laughs> and, and he's like, oh, yeah, but blah, blah, blah. So now, so, so I said yes. So I got a I gotta win, now, win, I got a win, win idea yes. for you. It's a total win, win. It's a, it's a classic, Wes. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. So, so that's how it happened. And uh, uh, now he does it for like 20 other people, including now ARC. So. Well, he talks about you as the poster success. of how to launch an ETF, right? Totally. So yeah, yeah. the, the, you know, one of the things they talk about is that you have to have a following, you have to have a passion project, knowing that you're going to get into this and it's going to be a grind for the longest time. You need to reach, I don't know what to break even for an ETF these days. I don't remember. Depends like on the, how much do you, the, usually it's 50 million. Yeah, it depends yeah. on the, depends on the expense ratio. Right. Right. So, so you got to ramp up to 50 million fairly quickly. And, and when you got into it, what was your. What was your view on that? You're like, oh, I'm going to be in 50 in six months. Like what, how, what level of, um, of, of, you know, commitments that you have when you were going into it. And I was the rest expecting of that two is... years. I was planning for two years. And I'm when did you launch it? Years. Um, May of 2019. Wow. Good for you. But then of course That's COVID amazing. happened. You know, right. So yeah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that you raise money if you get a 50% yeah. or a 30%. I was literally rate. like, are we going to survive? I, I, I remember um, Lauren Templeton, um, the of the Templetons, right? Um, reached out to me. I was like, hey, I love this. How can we help? I was like, hey, like you're, you know, on the a trustee at the Templeton Foundation. Do you guys want to help us? Like literally asking for charity. And they were like, uh, <laughs> you know, you're, you're actually a for-profit organization. I was like, oh, yeah. And so, <laughs> so, I mean, literally, I didn't know we were going to survive. And I was like, <laughs> and right. so, um, so I, you know, thankfully for people in our community, uh, you know, and there, that was a scary time for product issuers and, and, and uh, you know, providers. So, so yeah, uh, there are times when I, I didn't know if we would survive. And I'm, I'm glad, that, you know, now coming from the other side of that, but, you know, you guys know there's many times like that. So it's all part of the adventure. It's called being an entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah. Right. If you're That's not terrified true. every other quarter, you're not doing it right. Yeah. <laughs> and not only that, I mean, there's people like, oh, you, you cry every night um, because you're terrified. But now, like, I'm at a point where I, I came to a point where I was like crying because I was exhausted. I was like, I'm just so tired. Because <laughs> you're, you're growing so much, right? Yeah. <laughs> No, I'm feel, so, we're feeling a little bit of that here as well. We're yeah. like 150 and we're like, this, we wanted this, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah we wanted this. this is, this is the dream. This is the, the heaven that we all like, spoke of. I'm so tired oh. living the dream. <laughs> 
Can I go back to mediocrity, please? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, but I, no, I love that's, it. That's uh, great. Obviously. It's a well, really, really good story. It's a huge success story. And, and you're, you know, you forge your own way in what is traditionally an extremely challenging industry. And um, to come out the other side with a hundred million dollars in your, in your fund in the first year and a half or so is just, you know, a tremendous a success. Yeah. No, well, congratulations. Yeah, I want to say that. Yeah. That's, that's Thank amazing. You. I appreciate that. Love it. Well, listen, um, for Thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, this has been really interesting, and uh, it was great to catch up with you again. Right? I, I yeah, want to say though, where people like, can I find say, you. Yeah, where can we yeah. find okay. you? Okay. Hey, this is not it alone. So thank you for that. Congratulations, and I appreciate people to celebrate it with. Uh, but I didn't do it alone, and you guys know that. Um, you know, so so they can find us on freedometfs.com is the ETF. Um, Life and Liberty Indexes.com is the index. Um, I'm on Twitter. Perth underscore toll uh, and on LinkedIn. <laughs> and and then in the next major economic forum with uh, uh, it, the top economists of the world doing some further uh, speeches, right? When that's it, right. Have you been invited <laughs> back be in, since? She'll be in Davos next year. Yeah, that's right. Davos <laughs> is, is up next. Um, back home. Awesome, Perth. So that's uh, okay. So we'll find you there. And, and just anybody who's still here, um, just don't forget to smash that like button, the subscribe, you know, share this amazing knowledge that uh, Perth has bestowed upon us today to the world if you can. And uh, let's have you again once you're, the moment you hit a billion in a couple of months, we're gonna have you here <laughs> and, and we're gonna pop some champagne this time. All right, cheers to you guys too. Congratulations on your, all of your success, so. Thanks. All right, Perth, <laughs> we'll have a great weekend and we'll chat Me soon. Too. All right. This episode is brought to you by Resolve Asset Management, Inc. Separately Managed Accounts, available for U.S. and Canadian investors. While diversification is often discussed, it is important that it actually be delivered. Through the suite of Resolve Global Mandates offered at varying risk levels, we aim to strike the balance between global diversification, appropriate risk balance, and directional alpha. Our portfolios are designed to safeguard and profit across many economic regimes, including periods of negative growth shocks or unexpected rising inflation, periods in which, in our view, the traditional 60-40 portfolios may fail to deliver adequate returns for investors. Resolve to improve your portfolio. Click on the link in the description to reach out to a representative and assess which Resolve mandate is right for you.